joining me now on the Knicks Film School podcast. An NBA player who played for eight teams over the course of his eight-year career, most recently with the 2019 world champion Toronto Raptors. Talk about going out on top. Um, much like he came in um, with a bang. We're going to talk about that today. Uh, one of the greatest undrafted players in NBA history and more importantly, the man who made millions of Knicks fans around the world believe in miracles once upon a time. Uh, Jeremy Lin, how you doing, sir? I'm doing great. Uh, man, that's uh, quite the intro. I was not ready for that. I appreciate that. <laughs> Uh, you know, I try to get you in the, in the right frame of mind at, uh, are you, are you're in the Eastern time zone, right? Where are you are right now? Uh, well, actually, uh, I'm in a, I'm in a hotel quarantine right now, uh, oh, okay. in, a- in Asia. And so, um, it's, it's nighttime over here. Uh, wow. Uh, so you've had uh, a day already and I, can I ask how long have you been in, in quarantine? Are you getting uh stir crazy already? Uh, I, this is day three, but, uh, I'm doing okay on this end. Um, you know, I, you know, I don't know if, uh, how many people know, I mean, it's, it's public information, but just last, last year, um, before the CBA season, I ended up getting COVID and I was in isolated quarantine for 77 days. And so, um, I am no, uh, I am no stranger to quarantine life. Uh, so three days is is nothing <laughs> yeah this is supposed to be like a vacation so far um <laughs> so uh yeah so just so everybody knows where we're talking here at the beginning of august uh even though this interview isn't going to air until a bit closer to the premiere of your documentary uh 38 at the garden uh got a chance to watch it last night uh amazing amazing stuff um and something that obviously you should be uh, incredibly proud to be a part of I want to get right into some of the stuff that the doc goes into. Um, and I want to kind of start before Linsanity, if that's all right. Uh, you know, yeah. you, I think a lot of people maybe even still don't know the full backstory of you where, you know, even going back to high school, you know, your mom had this nickname for you, Mr. Improbable. Uh, you go on to become player of the year in Northern California. Despite that, only two offers, MIT, Harvard. You go on to Harvard, you have the most successful season in Harvard history, uh, arguably one of the greatest Ivy League careers in basketball history. And then you go undrafted. I mean, I feel like by the time you got to the NBA, you kind of had the underdog thing down pat. Is that fair to say? I think I was, uh, yeah, I think I was pretty good with the with the underdog label, but I was kind of trying to kind of trying to get rid of it. <laughs> So your way to get rid of it was you obviously try to get drafted and you talk in the documentary about how you were going into these workouts and you were just killing it. Um, And you knew you were killing it. And yet the draft comes and you don't get drafted. And like going back and looking at it now, like there were only there's 10 more players from that 2010 draft class who end up scoring more points than you eight more with a higher scoring average, three more with a higher assist average. I mean, the only other guys from that class who averaged 11 and four for their career, a couple of guys who went to Kentucky who made a total of $400 million between them. I mean, this wasn't just a screw up on the part of GMs around the league. This was a massive all time screw up. When you were, when Linsanity was going on and you were doing what you were doing, was it kind of personal for you in that specific aspect uh, to show up everybody who passed on you? You know, that's, that's a great question. Um, I would say basketball has always been personal to me. Um, growing up, like it's been, it's always been personal because every, whenever anybody saw me, it was, it, it was always, uh, some level of disrespect or this we'll wait and see, but we're, you know, um, but even then still like that hesitation, you know, to me, it's, it, you know, so I grew up with a chip on my shoulder because that's the only thing I knew. Um, and so, uh, when you ask, is it personal? I mean, the, the whole, my whole journey has been very personal and I had to learn how to make it not as personal because I realized that I just spent my basketball time, even before becoming a professional, just like creating, taking the biggest villain in my mind and working to prove them wrong. 
and then proving them wrong and realizing that's not that fulfilling. And then only to be doubted again by somebody else. And here comes a new villain. Right. And, and I felt like that to me, that type of mentality was not something that I wanted to live in long-term. I mean, it was to the point where when I was not recruited by Stanford and I was lied to, I, when I was at Harvard, I had the head coach's face blown up on my computer, like full size every day when I logged in to do my homework or anything, all I saw was his face. And I was like, I'm going to prove you wrong. Like you made a mistake by not recruiting me. I mean, that's the level of, and that's the intensity that I had of, man, I'm going to, I'm going to chase my dream. I'm going to be great. And so basketball was always personal to me. Um, Am I recommending this for for the young kid, that average kid growing up? No, I'm not saying be like me, but that's what it was. And so then sanity was for sure a moment when I was like, look, I knew, I knew I was an NBA player. I did not think I was going to come in like that. I was not expecting that. I was surprised, uh, you know, a ton by all of that, but I knew that I belonged and I knew that a ton of people didn't feel that way. So something I'm, I'm wondering as I'm hearing you talk about this is the whole concept of Linsanity. I think Linsanity means a lot of different things for a lot of different people. And in the doc, there are so many wonderful interviews with so many people of Asian American descent and talk about what it means, what it meant to them and what it still means to them to watch someone who you know looks like them, maybe comes from a similar background, do what you were doing. For me as a Nick fan, it was more rooted in like, well, wait a minute, this can't be real because this guy can't be that good. And this guy can't be that good because 30 GMs said no twice in the draft. And then he got to the Warriors and got cut and got to the Rockets and got cut. So I think that improbability, again, just I'm speaking for myself as a Knicks fan watching it at the time, that was what made it probably more special than, than anything. Do you ever stop to think about had it not been for that disrespect? that was shown to you that maybe Linsanity doesn't happen in the way that it happens. Oh, a hundred percent. And I've always said Linsanity was uh, the perfect storm of so many things coming together. And that's why the story means something different to each person that you ask, because you could talk about, the California, Northern California, which is, you know, not known for basketball. You can talk about that story. You can talk about the immigrant experience. You can talk about the Asian American experience. You can talk about the Harvard, going to Harvard and taking that route. You can talk about the undrafted aspect of it. You can talk about race. You can talk about faith. You can talk about so many different elements and so many different things that tied into the story. But at the end of the day, it was a culmination of so many different parts yeah. Of and so many different dimensions and sectors that merge into one story. And that's why, like, Lynn Sandy wasn't saying, if it was not in New York, if I was doing this in, in OKC or or Memphis Grizzlies, like, it's cool. But, you know, like, it, it, there was just so many things. I mean, even my teammates, like, the fact that I had, like, such high profile teammates, all of that played into it. the fact that our team was struggling so much early and we were just losing games and underperforming. I mean, everything contributed and built this story up more and more and more. And what you said just now is definitely a big part of, you know, the improbability is what made it a fan favorite story. Right. And, and, and that was definitely a big part of it. Yeah. And, you know, it's even, you mentioned Harvard, it, like, I feel like that doesn't get talked about because for, like the 99 point whatever percent of the world when you slap harvard that label on anything it's like oh okay it it means a certain thing when you slap it on a player who's trying to make it to the nba it means something completely different like there's that dissonance there which i'm sure you had to reconcile with over the course of your journey oh yeah i mean it's it's just so funny it's just so ironic because you you know normally, you know, uh, you know, especially with the model minority myth, when you're talking yeah. about certain things, you're talking about education or whatever. It's like, if you're Asian, you know, they're like, Oh, they assume certain things like, Oh, he's really smart or whatever. Or we're like, Oh, it's, it's going to look a certain way. And then, Oh, he went to Harvard and it's, Oh, it's going to look a certain way. But yeah. for me, it was like, man, in my career, like in my path, being Asian in Harvard was yeah. like, not at all, not at all beneficial. I mean, no. that was like the first player from Harvard within the last 50 years. And I was the first Asian American in the last like 60 years. And so, I mean, you know, there's, you know, it was like the two, two things that would help if I had gone in a different direction, like, uh, you know, not so much in, in this career path. Yeah. 
Yes. How could we forget the great Ed Smith, uh, the pre- form, pre- previous player from Harvard who played also for the Knicks, oddly enough, and uh, way back in 1954, um, had zero points in his first game. Uh, not not quite as good as uh, when you made your leap. <laughs> anyway, let's talk about the Knicks. Um, there's this great line in the doc where Tyson Chandler talks about and you talk about running into each other in the hallway when you first got on the team. And he's like, how did a fan get in our in our hallway here with where the players only like I'm, I have to go back to the beginning of that year because like there's no point guard there's no true point guard on the team putting you aside for a minute like they start Tony Douglas Tony Douglas nice little player but he, he played shooting guard the previous year that wasn't working they Mike says okay screw this we're just not going to play a point guard played chump kind of running the point they gave Mike Bibby a try were you looking around at some point being like come on coach but Put me in here. Uh, I I could help. (laughs) Oh, I mean, it was just, I mean, I can't even explain the constant, like, anxiousness, frustration, like, that I felt of, I show up, you know, right as the season starts, I miss all the training camp. No one knows what I can do. No one has seen me play. We're playing because of lockout season. We're playing four times a week and, and being Tony does not practice. You know, it's, it's all walkthroughs. And so we're just doing all walkthroughs. No one ever plays contact unless, you know, you're with a group that comes way before practice, but like, and I'm sitting there and I'm watching, you know, Baron Davis jump, Tony Douglas, Mike, baby, everybody struggling, the team struggling, everybody getting hurt. And I'm just like, and, and meanwhile, I'm fighting for my life. I've already been cut twice. And I'm like, dude, if I don't get a shot, if I don't get a shot, like I don't even get a chance to show them what I can do. Like it's over before it even started. And they sent me to the D league and, and I play one game and I have a 28 point triple double. And I come back up and I'm like, that's gotta mean something. That's gotta mean something you got. And, and still it was like weeks are going by and I'm just watching this whole thing unfold. And I'm just like, Dude, I'm about to get cut, and I have not even gotten a legitimate chance. And, and I, I mean that people talk about that, but it's like to go through that for months and just to be sitting there, like all oh, like running on the treadmill after the game, getting to the arena like hours before the game, like staying before shoot around and after shoot around, beating the coaches, assistant coaches, and head coaches to to the practice facility, and like working out and like to do that and just like not even know if I'm going to ever get a chance. And then to like basically have my career end because of that is like, Oh my goodness. I can't even, I don't even want to like relive it as I'm like talking about it right now. It's like something that I've like cut that portion I've cut out and just kind of jumped to like, it sucked. And then insanity, you know, (laughs) Um, how I like, you know, and I'm sleeping on my brother's couch too. You know, I'm just like for six weeks, I'm sleeping on his couch being like, dude. And then he had like, he had like family friends or something over, which is what got you over to Landry's uh, much smaller couch for a period of, for, I guess, a couple, couple of nights. Right. Yeah, no, exactly. I was just like, man, it was just like, it was like, it was almost like a movie, like, yeah. like a, like a comedic movie where I was just like, this can't be serious. Like, <laughs> you know, so, so speaking of can't be serious, the Knicks are, Two and eleven at one point in a, a stretch of two and eleven, where the only wins I think came against that Bobcat team that won seven games, and then a Pistons team that wasn't much better. Um, you talk a lot about the Nets game on the dock, obviously, because that, that's kind of the beginning of it. You didn't start that game, but you got thirty some odd minutes, and you had, you know, twelve points in the in the fourth quarter. Great second half, the whole thing. Uh, you're losing that game going into the fourth quarter. Like that's I, I did not remember that. Was anything said to you before that Nets game by? by a coach, by anyone that like put it on your radar, like, Hey, tonight's the night. No, but the night before. Okay. So we had a back to back to back and that second game yeah, was against Boston. Boston at Boston. And that's when they told me during shoot around after shoot around, they're like, Hey, I think we're going to give you a shot tonight. And then, you know, um, and they're like, just try not to do too much. <laughs> like, uh, okay. Um, and then That's I great. played bad. I just I just played like really safe and that never works out for me. So it's just a dud of a performance. And then, you know, we had a game in New York and then we go to Boston and then we fly back to New York to play the Nets for the third game. And everyone's dead tired. We land at like 2 a.m. and we had to drive an hour to get to, you know, wherever you're from the airport. And so the next day, no one's like, 
I mean, everyone's zombies. Like everyone's just so tired. There's no community. It's just like get through warm up, start the game, hurry up and yeah. start the game, end the game, so we can all get tomorrow off. And uh, that was kind of the environment. So I was going in just like no idea what's going to happen tonight. But my agent Roger Montgomery has said like, "Hey, this is probably your last game. Yeah. If they don't put you in, there's nothing you can do. But if they do, like it's got to, it's go time for sure." And so. I was just hanging on to the hope that that would happen. Thank you, Shump, for getting two early fouls. <laughs> yeah. And then, uh, yeah, I mean, you, you, you won the game for them. Uh, two assists also in that fourth quarter, I should mention. So then the next game is the Utah game. Do you remember the moment where you were, were you told you were starting? Was it just like, you know, was there a conversation or was it just like, okay, here's the starting lineup tonight, you know, go ahead and do it. Yeah. So I, uh, you know, I had heard from Kenny Atkinson, like, Oh, like, you know, I think in the coaches meeting, they're, they're talking about potentially starting you. Oh, wow. And I was like, no, and I was like, no, <laughs> don't start me. Don't start me. I was like, please don't. Um, I have not, I have like literally not done one rep, not one rep in practice. For the months that I've been on the team, I've not done one rep in practice with the first team. I was like, I have zero chemistry with them. Don't put me in with them. Um, and then he, I think he was just like, we'll see. I mean, you know, Mike, you know, uh, Coach Antonio, he's just, he's going to, you know, he'll make the decision. And so I was like, that was put on my radar the day before the game. Then we get to the game. I'm like, oh, he's for real. I'm starting. Okay. <laughs> Uh, well, we'll see how it goes, I guess, you know, and it's just like, you know, at that point, um, it was just like between like Tyson and stat, it was just like, one of them's going to set a pick and roll and they're going to roll and dunk on somebody. So I'm like, all right, well, we can work with that. And so, and stat uh, for that game, uh, I forget if the injury happened in the previous game, but what he wasn't in the starting line at that game. He didn't in play. And then sure enough, five minutes into the Utah game, Melo goes out. So I'm wondering, as you're talking about having the better chemistry with the bench unit, maybe that, did that help get things going off on the right foot? Yeah, actually, you know what? You're right. I totally, um, so Amari had a family, um, had a family emergency. Had a family uh, that's tragedy. what it was. Yep. That's why he was gone. And then uh, Melo got hurt early into that game. And, uh, and for me, you know, it was almost like, who else is the ball going to go to, you know, like <laughs> it like almost had to be in my hands after the New Jersey game. I was like, okay, well, I mean, he did that last game. So, and our two max players are gone. So here, you know, and that's just what it was. And, and I mean, we just got lucky that we were playing against a Utah team that really struggled in pick and roll coverage and had, you know, four and five that were, you know, not as quick, you know, foot speed wise, you know, uh, no offense to Al Jefferson, who was my teammate when I was at the Hornets. Um, I love him to death and he knows that, but, um, but just, yeah. you know, being able to kind of attack the paint um, and attack the rim and just get a little bit of a flow. And, and that was one of those things where like in D'Antoni's offense, as long as you kind of, as long as you kind of have a baseline understanding of the principles, you can actually like create a lot of offense really quickly. There isn't like the nuances of maybe the triangle offense or something that would take so long with that um, to, to, you know, this learning curve. And so um, it's definitely a quicker acclimation process. So again, just speaking from my perspective as a Nick fan, after that Utah game, I was all in like, I, I saw what I needed to see. I was like, okay, the first game, you know, and it, like I going back and listening to Breen's calls for the Nets game, even in the air of his voice, it was like, what a cool night for, for this team and for this kid. And like Pablo talks about it on the dock or um, I think it was Hassan Minaj talks about it on the, on the dock. Like, Oh, that's a cute, that's a cute thing after the jazz game. Now we got two and with, again, with no mellow except for five minutes and no stat. I'm like, okay, we're here. Then the Wizards game, then the Lakers game, which is the focus of the documentary. So I don't want to spend too long on it. But like, I have to ask, because you didn't say it, I don't think in the doc, and I don't know if you've ever said it. Did did Kobe say, I, we know what Kobe said beforehand. Did Kobe say anything to you after that game? No, um, me and Kobe never addressed anything until we became teammates in L.A. Okay. And then he addressed it. 
Um, but after the game, we definitely didn't address it. I mean, I, 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 you know, when the buzzer went off, I was, I had zero, zero desire to like talk to anybody else. I just wanted to celebrate my teammates. I wanted to go like, I remember just like, I need to go and shower and like go hug my family because this is such an insane night. And then we had to go straight to the airport to play Minnesota in Minnesota the next night. And I just remember it being such a heck. And I'm just like, man, if, if that game was not on the front end of a back to back, like if we could have had the next day off, and I could have really soaked it in with my family, but really all it was, was like, I had to do all my stuff and then like, you know, basically two minute hello and then off to the airport. Um, but man, what an experience. Um, but yeah, no, Kobe and I did not talk after the game. Um, I won't, you know, I'm sure it's personal between you, whatever he said when you joined the team, but was, did you feel like you ended up in a good place together after what initially went down? Yeah. And, you know, I was never like that, that offended by it per se, like, because it, at that point it wasn't personal. Um, yeah. like it was, but it wasn't like, I, I didn't know him personally. And so for him to say like, you know, when he said like, I don't, I don't know what's going on. I mean, maybe he really didn't, you know, and in my mind, I was like, okay, maybe he really didn't because he's on the East coast road trip, you know, and they were playing in Boston. They had just finished yeah. a game in Boston. So maybe he actually doesn't know what's going on. He didn't watch the news. But in my mind, I was also, I was like, so I was okay with him not knowing, but I was kind of like, why did he have to say it in the tone and the, the way tone. that he did with the, with the laughs and the like, yep. let's not get ahead of ourselves. Like that, I was like, okay, that's, that was like, you didn't need to do all that. But if you didn't, didn't hear about it or didn't know about me, like he knew about me the year before because we, I met him and we played against him and it's like, okay, what other Asian, how many other Asians are there in the NBA? I'm pretty sure you'll remember me. Like I'm the yeah. only Asian we met at all star. And I just, he, um, like he definitely, we, we played against each other multiple times, you know, four times the previous year. And I was getting on the court for some of those games. When I was at the Warriors. And so, um, you know, I just, uh, it, it wasn't like personal, personal, but I just felt like it would, it could have been, a little bit more respectful in the way that he went about it. So speaking of respect, um, I, I could sit here and talk to you for hours about the rest of insanity alone, but I do want to get to a little bit of, of what happened afterwards. Uh, so the mellow comes back at some point uh, and Amari comes back and like, you got the team together and then there's struggles. Uh, I think you beat the Cavs, and then after that, you like lost six in a row. And just like it was it, it, clearly something was off. And in years since, like we've heard Coach D'Antoni and Amare talk about how maybe you know Melo had some trouble adjusting to the fact that there was obviously someone now that had the ball in their hands a lot, and like all that that entailed. Um, meanwhile, again, speaking from my perspective as a fan, I was watching this and I'm like, Can we just please go back to doing what was working um, and whatever that would have to have to happen to make, to make that a reality. I'm wondering, did you feel that from the fans? And also did you sense anything from, you know, like Mello or anybody else on the team about like, you know, some tension or anything like that? The only thing I sensed was, um, so the fans never really, like, I wasn't really aware of everything that was going on with the fans and I'm not sure how many people were, but the only tension I would say, you know, in my mind, it was kind of like, um, it was not conflict. It was just tension of like, how do we merge all the different, you know, weapons that we have on a court and, and how do we figure it out? And I felt like everybody was genuinely committed to that and trying to get that done. Um, you know, and, and so I never actually had any conflict with anybody. We just knew that like, Hey, look, obviously, you know, you're like number one mid post isolation player in the NBA and yeah. I'm, you know, happen to be doing my thing with the pick and roll. Yeah. Um, those two don't really bode well together. Um, and so it was almost like that. Um, but yeah, nothing personal, at least from my end, you know, we had, we had never had any type of remotely, any type of verbal conflict. And yet, um, despite those two contrasting styles, you went on a stretch 
next seven games, six and one, you outscored your opponents. I looked it up yesterday by 98 points, best d- double the next best team in the league. You guys were rolling and then you get hurt. Um, do you think you guys were figuring it out? And do you, do you think it would have worked if you had kept, kept being able to stay on the court for the rest of that year? Yeah. I mean, I, I do think at that point we were figuring it out and it was just like, um, like a big, what if, right. Um, because I think, I just think who knows what would have happened. Like, and, and, you know, one, if I don't get hurt, maybe, you know, maybe things go differently and maybe we get a different seed yeah. and maybe yeah. we don't match up with Miami in the first round of the playoffs. Maybe we make it to the second round. Who knows? I mean, by then, once you get to playoffs, it's like, you know, that's the most beautiful time of the NBA season because during the regular season, maybe you have time and space to like be jockeying for like, you know, uh, personal accolades or stats or whatever. But when it comes yeah. down to the playoffs, like, Man, you know, I've been in the playoffs a few times. It's like, it is so fun to be, to have everybody be so bought in to like just winning. Like that is the purity of the game. I never signed up as a professional basketball player to, to be, you know, fighting over fan popularity or endorsement deals or yeah. salary cap issue. Like, you know, it was always for the game. And and it was like, look, it's 12 players, 15 players, whatever it is that you have in your team, all bought into one goal. And, and that's why I love the playoffs so much. Man, who knows? But it's a big what if. Uh, it's something I will always wonder myself, uh, as well as, you know, moving forward past that season. And, you know, your next year, with the Rockets and like, again, I, I don't think enough people really pay attention to the fact, like they think it's like Linsanity and you put up numbers for these couple of weeks. And then the rest of your career was like, like, no, you're like for a six year stretch, even that season, I think it was a total of 26 games over that stretch. You put up 18 and seven. The only other guys in the league that year to put up those numbers were Chris Paul, Derek Rose, Deron Williams. Um, I think one more, one more guy who's like, you know, Hall of Fame, all-star caliber player. Like you were killing it and you continued to kill it in Houston. And a couple of times you killed it was against the Knicks in the next season. You you destroyed them in Houston in your first game that you played them. And then you came into the garden. Mello wasn't in, in that second game. But again, you were up by 20 something going into the fourth quarter. Um, were those matchups? I know you said basketball is always personal for you, but like, was there a little something extra when you went back and, and played the Knicks the next year? There was so much extra, like not even a little, but there was so much extra that it was like, like people, like my family knew, like my teammates knew it was like, look, tonight is my night. Like tonight's my night. This is, this is like, give me the ball. Um, And I I remember like, both of those games were really good games and we won both of them. And I had a huge game in New York and, and we, and we, you know, I I had like, you know, I I think I might've been like 20, 21 and 11 or something like that. I forget what it was. And we had that blow. And I was just like, I mean, that was one of the like most vivid memories I have still of like getting onto the bus after I remember the, I even remember the photo that I chose and, and my to post on Instagram. And, to, you know, it was like <laughs> one of those things where like, it was, uh, it meant a lot to me in the moment for sure. Um, and that spurred you guys too. To what I had mentioned. What's that? Did you, you, that spurred you guys too. Cause you won, I think nine of 11 in, uh, in yeah. Houston at starting with that game that really set you guys on a certain path for that year. For sure. For sure. And so, you know, those, you know, and, and those, uh, those are fun games, man. Those are just so highly emotional for me. And, um, you know, you had what ended up to be a a great career. I, I wonder how much better it even could have been like one game with your second season in Brooklyn. And it's just the one game and then you get hurt and you have talk about, you're having a great game in that game too. Um, and it's just like, it feels like as great as you were, there was even more meat on the bone. And like, I personally will always wonder, um, what could have been, what could have been pot- potentially here in New York, looking back now, when you think about how there are so many Nick fans out there who still look at you and Lynn sanity as the one 
like purely positive, good, happy memory that they have of this team in the last 20 years. And I, I, that may feel like overstating it, but like, you know, again, I've lived it. Uh, I've lived it and died it. Um, that, that stands alone. What does that mean to you um, to be thought of in that way by, by millions of Knicks fans all over the world? Well, first, let me just rewind because the one thing that you said, um, you said that, you know, there might have been more meat on the bone. Yeah, I don't really talk about this much, but you're the first journalist that's, you know, kind of really talked about it that way. But that's how I've always felt about my career. But it's just there isn't there isn't that like because everybody looks at me and they're like, oh, you're historic, you're a trailblazer, you've done so much beyond what anybody ever thought. And so everyone's like, oh, this is our expectation and you overshot it like a hundredfold. But for me, I'm always like, okay, this is where I'm at, but I know there's more. Had I not gotten hurt for two straight years in in Brooklyn, had certain trades not happened, had this not happened, had that not happened. And I've always felt like, man, there's so much more meat on the bone. Dude, that was your Um, prime in Brooklyn. I remember watching those Nets games. I was like, man, this guy should be doing this across the damn river. I even... Then, several, however many years later it was, four or five years later it was, because at Kenny, you talked about Kenny before. Kenny knew you. Kenny knew your game, and it was clear, yeah. and it worked. Yeah, no, for sure. I mean, and even the season that was healthy, it was just tough because I had those three straight hamstring injuries. I was under minute restrictions, yeah. but I remember thinking like, oh, if I was at my per thirty six minutes, like if I wasn't under minute restriction, I would average like twenty and twenty and eight, and I was like, yeah. oh, that would have been all star numbers. But again, uh, I, I just wanted to rewind and say like, oh, I, I appreciate you saying that because I've never heard, uh, you know, a journalist say that because, you know, most everybody's like, oh, wow, like you kind of you've done so much already. Um, yeah. But going back to your original question of, uh, you know, what does that mean? I think to me, the fact that Knicks fans still hold that memory so near and dear to their heart. Um, that, you know, it really hit home when COVID in 2020 was, you know, really hurting New York city. And at that time, New York was like the, the hot spot for COVID and, and it was shutting down and it was like one of the lowest moments in recent history for the city. And the Knicks went through, decided to do Linsanity week. I mean, they could have aired Ewing or, or, you know, Clyde or whoever, like they could have aired a ton of different amazing players and they chose to go with insanity week at that point i knew like wow new york just they still have my back like they it, it was very special to 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 process that because i'm like hold on you guys realize like i didn't even play 30 games for you guys <laughs> <laughs> like, i didn't play 30 games for you guys um like are you sure you guys you know i'm like Telling the Knicks, like, you, you, you guys sure you don't want to do like a, you know, Ewing week instead of Insanity week or something like that? Like, um, but no, that's what it means. And, and, you know, this is something that maybe I'll never fully understand. I think that's the beauty of it is that I'll never fully understand it from a fan perspective. Um, and, and I don't think I should. Um, and I think that's something I, I really, you know, I really appreciate. On that note, um, Jeremy Lynn, it's been a pleasure. You are the man. You are in dear, uh, indeed, um, near and dear to the hearts of Knicks fans everywhere. Uh, I hope, um, you know, best of luck this year uh, in, uh, you know, China. I can't wait to see what's next for you. And uh, I can't wait to uh, have everybody experience this documentary as well. Appreciate it. Thanks. Of course.